Okay. Good evening, everybody. Hello and welcome to Careering Ahead. Sorry, we're a few minutes late kicking off, um, but we are now here. And this week I am joined by the lovely Amy Swales from York Racecourse. Um, this is the latest in our series of Careering Ahead interviews. Views. We've had a whole series over the winter and um, we've been trying to keep things ticking over with interviews and events for um, our lovely members who we obviously haven't been able to see because of COVID. But uh, we are very hopeful now that the world is opening up that we are, are going to be able to get together in person later in the year. Um, Things will be coming out via the Women in Racing mailing list. So do keep an eye on that. If you are a member, you will be subscribed anyway. But the next big thing in the diary is the Women in Racing AGM, we are, where we are very, very fortunate that Claire Balding is going to come and speak to us um, about her life in racing and about her career. Um, she's going to do a quick Q&A with us. So um, that went out in the mail shop today. If you haven't popped it in your diary, then have a look. It's on the events page of the Women in Racing website as well. And we are absolutely excited about that um with regards to the agm we also have a couple of committee positions available um a couple of our lovely committee members have stepped down because they have been on for six years which is the limit of our tenure so if you're interested in joining the committee of women in racing we would absolutely love to hear from you we're particularly looking for somebody with an interest in social media so if that's you then uh just let us know do get in touch um via the website uh, or speak to any of the committee you can always drop us an email um, and we will be in touch with you about that so I'm delighted that today's guest is the lovely Amy Swales who is involved in marketing and sponsorship at York Racecourse she has worked there for 12 years which is a long time <laughs> and um, clearly is one of the York family through and through um, she does a sterling job there um, as many of you will know that York is one of one of the best places to go racing in the UK and it's often one of those race courses that people say oh it's my favorite um so yeah really really delighted that we have amy here today to discuss her career with us about everything that she's up to in marketing how she got started and where she is going uh, we were just chatting a little bit off camera before we started about last week at the dante festival so amy welcome thank you so much for joining us um yeah. how was last week how did it go well, firstly, I'm just going to say my little boy is having a bath upstairs with his father and I can hear them getting progressively louder. So if you hear any bangs or any shouts, that is them. So I'm going to apologise <laughs> now. I send them up very quickly before I started the interview. Um, so sorry, going back to the Dante Festival last week. Um, as I was saying to Naomi before we started the call, um, it was fantastic to have horses back at the race course. Um, we were fortunate that we were able to continue racing um, most of our season last year, we were fortunate to have the Welcome to Yorkshire Ebor Festival um, during the pandemic and be able to see horses on the track. So to be able to see them back again for the Dante Festival was great. We had some fantastic winners. I get very excited about the Dante because as a festival as a whole, it's where a lot of horses start off. It's where, it, this is a really overused word in marketing, but it's where the narrative of the horses start for this season, I feel. So it's that potential that they have. And I think that comes to fruition during the season. So it's some really exciting stories that started last, last week. Um, it was a shame we didn't have crowds, but we're welcoming back crowds this Saturday. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah, and how's that all shaping up, Amy? How are you feeling about having crowds back? What's the kind of sense around the race course? And, and how many people are you expecting this weekend? Yeah, so we haven't had a race goer on the course since October 2019 which just mm. seems crazy I know it's, it's very similar for a lot of other race courses in terms of their seasons but that's the last time they had race goers and I think there's something about the race course that comes alive when people are there um, and we very much notice it anyway because normally we never race between October and May so we do have we have a non-race day events but you don't have the crowds that come to a race course on a race day and you very much notice a buzz about the place. And I think that's what we've missed. And it'll be great to have it back on Saturday. It's been fantastic though. We've been, our race goers have been so loyal throughout the pandemic. They have been true advocates of what we do at the race course. Many have chosen to roll over to this year. So many kept their money with us um, that they booked in advance for 2020 and now coming in 2021. And they've been great on social media and supporting us. So 
we've not felt alone. We've felt they've still been there, but it'll be great to have them cheering on the horses. In terms of crowd, it will be a limited crowd. So um, in the government guidance, that's we can have up to 4,000 people. And that will be a mixture of race goers. Um, we've been delighted that the industry has worked so hard to be able to invite owners back much more earlier. So it'll be great to have them back on course again. Obviously, they've been back on course, but it'd be great to have them with the race goers, with the trainers, with the horses. It, it kind of is what makes a race day, really. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I certainly felt that last night. I had my, I was saying to Amy, uh, I had my first night of the races with owners last night, and definitely gives a, a a more palpable sense of excitement in the air. To hear people yeah. cheering was actually really strange, um, but you know, but lovely. And 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 obviously the stable staff and and owners have have been brilliant in the absence of more general crowds. But it was really nice to have a crowd back at the race course last night. So, and. Um, just going back to the Dante, what was your highlight of last week, Amy? I know for me, the Musadora is a race that is always absolutely wonderful every year. We've been there for women in racing at the Musadora before. Um, you guys have really kindly hosted us for the AGM at York. Um, what was your, do you have a particular favourite race of that festival or what was your highlight from last week? Um, I think the Musadora was fantastic. Um, it was actually Aidan O'Brien's first winner of the Musadora. Oh, no way. Yeah, nice. so I just... Um, it was, I think, another highlight was the fact that we were able to just know we were going into racing. It felt different for the Dante this year. Like last year, we didn't have a Dante festival. So we had some of the races, but they weren't on a festival. So I think it was that that was just fantastic, that you felt we were having the Dante festival, but we knew we were going to go into a season that had much more promise. Last year, we had a few of the races that were important to the pattern at different times of the year but it wasn't the same as having them all in a festival so that was fantastic um as well there's a horse called winter power to east of his horse that won um very convincingly so it'll be interesting to see what they do it's always nice to have some yorkshire winners combined with the big yards um from newmarket so i think that was a good thing in the festival as well it's nice to welcome back Yorkshire trainers and just welcome back, everyone back to York really. Definitely, definitely. And we're going to circle back to um, the beginning of your career shortly, but just tell me, after, just tell me, Amy, how has your job been affected by the pandemic? Were you furloughed? And, and I know, well, obviously a lot of race course staff all over the country have, were, were impacted by that. How has it been for you both kind of in the early stages of the pandemic and, and now transitioning back to normality? Yeah, so um, the early stages were quite strange because there's an, obviously an unknown. I'm not great with unknowns. Um, I like certainty. So um, it was a strange time. I love my life in terms of I work three days a week at the race course and I look after my little boy for two days a week. And I really like that balance. And I um, have always been quite passionate about still maintaining my career as well as having a child. That's something that's quite important to me and is a good balance for my mental health as well. So to go into a time when I was with my little boy, Charlie, 24 seven was really strange. And um, looking back in actual fact, I got to spend time with him. We had a glorious summer last year and we spent most of our time in the garden. So I can look back on it now, having come, coming through it, thinking actually we, we had a, a great time, Charlie and I. But um, in terms of my job at the race course, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty about when we were going to race next. That's what I forgot when we were coming back to the Dante Festival this year and you start thinking about back to last year, we genuinely didn't know when we were gonna have race goers back. We, we had to be nimble in our approach. We've been that throughout the whole um, year. I was very fortunate that the race course had been and always have been, that's one of the reasons I've probably been there for 12 years is they're so supportive. They are, a, we are a fantastic team. And you started the interview by saying the like the race course family, and it's so true. I say it all the time that everyone at the race course is a family. So it was quite hard to be isolated from them. Mm -hmm. um, in the time, obviously we had Zoom and it was getting to know bits and pieces. But yeah, it was a really strange time at the beginning. I feel very fortunate that we were able to have the Welcome to Yorkshire Festival. That was a massive thing, I thought. And when 
trainers and owners were coming on course and saying, oh, it's such a shame. And I'm like, well, to be honest, for me, I'm, I'm just, I'm so glad that we've got these races on and we're able to have such an amazing festival again. Um, in terms of what it's looking like now, so I was like, just going back to what my, kind of my status was, we were obviously a lot of us were on furlough, the majority of us were on furlough, just to maintain some, it was trying to save some income because nothing was, coming, not income, save some money because nothing was coming in. So, um, and our job during the season, obviously, is to race and we weren't racing. And then we moved on to flexible furlough. We're now, the whole team is back at the race course now. So we're fortunate oh, yeah. that we haven't lost anyone through the pandemic. Um, and coming back into racing now, it's great. I must admit, it's, it's, it's been quite good in terms of how we've done it. So we all came back. I was pretty much back by January, really. Um, and we've kind of eased into it. So now we're racing. It, the build-up is fine. But I think if we'd literally been on further last week and racing this week, I think it would have been <laughs> quite different. But now we're going into a season, hopefully, where we've got, well, we have got the whole team back and hopefully um, we can plan with some confidence. Yeah, I know. It's so exciting. I think what you say there about that level of uncertainty affecting people's mental health, it's easy to forget the situation we were in a year ago now. But, you know, this time last year, we, we weren't racing. You know, we were waiting for the 1st of June and that whole time I think was kind of filled with uncertainty for a lot of, of people and I think speaking honestly about the effect that that had on people is something that's only kind of coming to light a bit now and I know everyone was being encouraged and certainly the BHA have been brilliant about encouraging people to talk about their mental health and, and if they are struggling but I think there's a lot of hidden um, angst with with all of that as well Amy so it's it's refreshing to hear you say that you did find it difficult being at home and I think people who like a lot of structure like I'm someone who's used to going out and about to work all the time and I think if you are that person like we are it is hard to suddenly just be thrown into having nothing to do you yeah. know exactly and I'm uh, quite fortunate in where we live I literally live a stone throw from the race course and a stone throw from my parents and I've chosen that life for myself because I, I love the being surrounded by the people I love and being close to work. And then that doesn't really matter in a pandemic. It doesn't matter how close they are. You can't, still can't see them. No, for sure, for sure. So just winding back to the beginning, where did your interest in racing come from? Have you always been passionate about racing since you were a little girl? You're Yorkshire born and bred, I gather, but- um, No, I'm have, not. Are I'm you not? Are you not? Oh, where are you I'm from? Lincoln, I'm northeast Lincolnshire, I'm from Grimsby. Oh, okay. So, yeah, Excellent. so I, um, to be honest, I, loved horse riding when I was younger I have um quite an academic background so I was never allowed uh, my own pony my parents said that I have to concentrate on my exams more than having a horse which I am an only child and that is the one thing that I, I always consistently say to my parents now at 35 I'm like I was deprived as a child and <laughs> um, not being able to have my own pony but um we had a really good local riding school and um, so I went there every week and as much as I could in the holidays and I loved it I was I wasn't a very um I didn't like sport at school but and I wasn't a very well not I wasn't a very active child I was always out in the garden but I wasn't one that did running and sports so to actually be able to do something on horseback was fantastic and I, I just loved it um, and then I went to a school um out at Caister on Lincolnshire Walls um and that is close to market race and really close to market racing. So that was the first race course I went to growing up. And then I kind of looked for, I, I loved, I loved horses, but I knew I wasn't ever going to go down kind of the riding instructor route or something similar to that, because I just, I hadn't got the right, the strength to do it, like in terms of my riding, but also I knew that my path was kind of, exams a levels university and I went on that path and then I um looked at grad schemes and the BHA grad scheme popped up and and that's what I went for amazing so you went to York University to study politics was that a decision you that you that you kind of knew was going to be a good one in terms of you know had you planned to go into marketing did you think you might do something more political did you choose a general degree because it was something you were interested in how did that kind of come about Amy yeah so I chose politics because I didn't really know what I wanted to do 
Um, I knew it would be a good all round degree to have in terms of a skill set when I was looking for a graduate role. Um, so that's what I went into. York has a really good development politics department, um, which I kind of fell into. Um, I didn't realise this. I think one, one thing that I was quite naive about when I was looking at universities was location. Um, so I looked at that more than I looked at the modules of the degree. I knew I wanted to do politics, but it was actually the best degree I could have done for me. And then um, I, after my degree, I could either, I, got, I actually had a place that I only turned down a week before. I had to choose between going on the grad scheme or um, a master's in post-war reconstruction. And I chose the grad scheme. So I could have been in it's quite different. It's yeah, two quite different I think parts. my dad's side <laughs> side of, um it was it was yeah, he was definitely happy that I'd chosen the route I I, I went down in the end. Definitely well, I could have been out in Iraq. Oh sorry, go on. Sorry, I was gonna say I could have been out in Iraq. It was like you went from field trips to um, post post war countries. So I think he was happy. Gosh, that's quite a um that's quite a punchy masters, isn't it? Going post-war reconstruction. Yeah, it? it's one of the best in the world, actually. Um, and yeah, but um, horse racing captured my heart more than um, going into that did. So race going at market raising was was what got you into it. How did you hear about the BHA graduate scheme or how did that come onto your radar? I know we've discussed that a few times in Careering Ahead interviews. We've had a few previous BHA graduate scheme schemas on this uh, on this show um how did you kind of get into that and how did that cross your radar and, and what made you decide that racing was the industry for you amy so i actually did some work experience at york race course before i looked okay. at graduate programs because i i think i was probably one of the first years where you couldn't just walk into a job after being a graduate i think we'd had years of it where people thought go to university get a job easy and I think we were one of the first years where they were asking for more from their graduates there were more and more graduates coming through and I recognized that I needed a bigger skill set than just saying I've got a degree so I looked for work experience and I, I honestly can't believe that I got work experience at your race course because I know how many people write to me asking for work experience I know how many people I have to turn down we do have a graduate every year when we can um, because it's something I'm passionate about, that this is how I got into horse racing. I just happened to, I just emailed the race course website and said, I'm looking for some work experience over the summer. And that was it really. I was, I was there, um, I think my first summer was 2007, whilst I was still at university. And that's how I heard about the grad scheme was um, through just working at your race course and looking what I was going to do next. I loved it. I love the buzzer race day. I just love everything about working at the race course I genuinely can say that in the 12 years I've been there I've never been bored genuinely so yeah definitely found the right that's career a, that's a really that's a big statement to make and actually there's, there wouldn't be that many people that would say that they still love their job 12 years in as much as they did you know when they started let's say and and actually that's a real credit to York and you know I know that I said before they're often held up as being a real family and and lots of people who work there as far as I can see have been there a long time you know which is a real testament to an employer I think if people don't leave mm -hmm. um so so what did you do on the BHA graduate scheme Amy and how did you transition from there to going to York and into marketing and sponsorship so I worked at the tote so when it was based in Ooh. Wigan so yeah so the tote that's no longer um which was fantastic because it gave me a complete different insight into racing that I still draw on that experience now I haven't Obviously, I've only worked at your race course, if you can work out in my terms of my career. Um, but that betting background and how they, uh, they look at racing and how they look at the market. So I worked in the marketing department there and how they look at the marketing within racing and what they do is just great to see it from another perspective. It was, a, it was a strange time to work there because it was a time when they knew there was going to be redundancies and didn't quite know what the tote was going to look like in the future. Um, but it was still a fantastic time. Even though it was a summer, I learned so much in just one summer. And what would you say are the differences between the way, you know, a gambling or a betting company views the marketing versus a race course, Amy? Can you just expand on that a little bit? I would almost say their marketing it, it, i'm drawing on my experience at your race course mm. i would say their marketing is 
more strategic and it's more um it looks at they were definitely ahead of their time compared to a race course back then so in terms of looking at most of like a lot of gambling was done online then obviously the majority is now but in terms of looking at click-through rates knowing it and as well something they did which i think race courses do do now with the help of two circles is they understood that they had to know every individual customer so especially for their big um their the kind of their big supporters they would be invited to boxes at the race course they would have a direct line to someone they knew in in there and i think it was that that treating customers individually was something that they did 10 years before race courses really got their that got, got their claws into it mm. And is that something you've tried to implement at York as your career has gone on there, Amy? That increasing kind of the knowing your customer is, is a real kind of buzz phrase, isn't it? But, uh, but it is actually so important when you're marketing to people, because if you don't know what your customer avatar or demographic is, then you're going nowhere, really, are you? <laughs> no. Yes. But I also think it, it, it was naturally there at York anyway. So our mm. bookings team are absolutely amazing. Like you mentioned in terms of the majority of the team have worked there a long time. Our bookings manager has been there since she was 18. She's worked there nearly 40 years, I think, now. Wow. Um, let me do the math. She'll probably kick me and be like, no, it's more like 30. <laughs> but, um, and all the team, like the, the, the lady that works on reception, Alison, I call her my race course mum because she's been there and she's just been support. She's known me since I was 20. And that team there are just fantastic at knowing individual customers so before any marketeers were like we have to know our customers we were probably actually doing it anyway we have mm. the people not so much now but there was people that used to send in a blank check to Karen and just write and say you know what I have please just sort my sort tickets and badges out and I think that's something we've just not let go of we fought to keep that and there'll be people that ring up Karen and they'll book through Karen every year and she'll know individual customers and I think all we've done is recognize the strength of that and what it means and how valuable it is for your race course and like with the help of two circles and the work they've been doing in the industry it's just been fantastic to kind of put data behind some some things we already naturally do if for those people who don't know, can you talk to us about Two Circles, Amy, and what involvement they have in the work that you do? Yeah, so Two Circles, essentially, they collect data from all the race courses and they analyse it for us in terms of booking information. Um, they were someone that's brought on by the RCA and they're a fantastic team. They work in across sports, so they work in um, cricket, football, maybe te tennis, I think, as well. Um, and they are instrumental in helping us understand our customer across the industry and one of the things the things that they say is the strength of the race course is that we all work together to get this data and to understand our customer as a whole and we don't act as competitors in in this arena because i don't think we are anyway but they've given us valuable insight in for instance that um race goers only on average go racing 1.2 times a year so it's what you do with that knowledge. And in, they've kind of helped us and supported us in that it's easier to shoot, to make sure those people come that once a year. So if they come to the Ebor Festival every year, the low hanging fruit is to remind them to come the next year. The hardest thing to do is change that frequency within a season. So it, it, I think what they've helped us do is they've helped us market smarter, definitely. Hmm. that's amazing it's so interesting Amy like those sorts of insights you know when you talk about it's about frequency of coming and getting repeated behavior rather than trying to change someone's behavior it's, it's absolutely fascinating I find that whole thing about the kind of economics of customer behavior really interesting um and just going back to working at York you know I think the word that sums up a lot of what we're talking about of longevity of staff and the kind of family environment is, is culture in the workplace what do you think it is and how do you think it is that that culture is promoted and really nurtured at York and I, I guess that's testament to the leadership but can you tell us a little bit about what what you think makes York a great place to be and what it is about the culture there and how it's established 
Yeah, I think, um, well, I've only ever been there when William, William Darby's been the chief exec, and he has been absolutely fantastic with, well, I see him being fantastic with everyone, but especially with me and my career progression, I mm. felt like I haven't had to go anywhere because he supported and developed what what I do. So I started off on the sponsorship information team when in 2007, then I worked up to exec level, and then I became one of the I think I maybe still am the youngest one of the youngest managers there and he um supported me in going on um the Peplo Management Academy that's run at the British Racing School I've done that and um, I've also do, recently done some media training with Ed Chamberlain so it's like even though I've been there for 12 years I'm still progressing and I think going back to what you say about the culture I think everyone has the confidence to shine at your race course we're all kind of championing each other and we all genuinely do work together I know it sounds a bit soppy but we are we are <laughs> a family like it is um and I do think that is partly the leadership but I also think it, it it's the people that work there and the team that, that we've created together really Mm, definitely um just before i carry on um anyone in the audience we've got a few quite a few of you out there if anyone wants to pop any questions in i forgot to say this at the beginning which i normally do uh, the q a box is open and the chat box is open so if you would like to pose amy any questions do feel free um we are open to all and any questions nothing too personal um but <laughs> um do feel free to, if you've got anything you want to ask about working at race courses marketing more generally um anything about york or the festivals or anything about anything really pop your questions in the q a or the chat box i monitor them both so we will pick them up from there you can post anonymously in the q a if you wish as well um so i was just going to wind back amy you mentioned your son charlie there um how have you kind of balanced motherhood with ambition because it strikes me you're you're a very bright very talented person you've talked about william kind of mentoring you and we'll come on to mentors as well but how have you kind of made that balance and how has that sort of changed your ethos around work if at all um, yeah, so my son is three years old and I very much, you can tell by the time, length I've worked there, I've grown up at your race course. So um, to then have a different perspective and during my maternity leave, genuinely, when, when I went on maternity leave, didn't know what I was going to do. Like, was I, I definitely knew I was going to go back, but how does working five days a week work and a lot of weekends when you've got a son and I've never, like, it is, he's my first child, so... I genuinely didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but it's actually, I think it's been the making of me in my role I am now because working three days a week, I'm far more focused and I'm far more, I have always been, like, when I was at school, I would always get um, the, when I got my reports, the top marks for effort, for instance. And I think now, it's made me work smarter in terms of what I do. So there'll kind of be, there'll be no messing about. I work three days a week and I'll prioritize what I need to prioritize. And it'll, it'll give me, I think it's given me kind of a more, a, a stronger management style because I'll, I'll know what we have to leave and I'll know what we have to progress with. And it is slightly hard to put across and then um, I've got friends in racing and I often say this to them when they speak about their jobs is you don't have to give everything you do 100% of your effort because it doesn't need it. There's some things that not that they don't really matter, but that you can do like that and just do them like that. Get them out of the way and really prioritise on the important things, the things that are going to make a difference in your career, but also make a difference to the department. Hmm. I love that. I love that phrase. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And uh, I think that's very wise advice. Um, you just alluded to managing people there, Amy. How many do you manage in your team at the moment? Yeah, so I've got one that works for me full time. So um, Matthew Sterling, who's fantastic. Um, so I've had someone that works with me um, probably, I'm trying to work out for how long, for about six or seven years. And that's something I really enjoy is working with people and I think it's something that the Pepler Management Academy was fantastic in this going on that quite early on in my management role was how to work with your people and work kind of their, with their strengths with their weaknesses but also that 
you can delegate and you can delegate in order for them to progress but also delegate to in order for you to be able to do more of your role I think that um I really that's something I really enjoy in my role is working with people and managing people and then on a race day we have um I probably have about um a team of 10 that work with me on a race day um so whether that's the information team but that kind of we have they're called the pink ladies who um are our sponsorship team and there's normally about seven of those on a race day we have a couple of um people that do the trophies for us and then um there'll be a couple of other people for instance like Matty and our photographers and different things but in in essence we're actually a really small team so in our marketing and sponsorship department at York there's three of us so there's James mm-hmm. Brennan who's been my head of marketing and sponsorship since since I started so when you talked about mentors and we're going to probably go on to that he's definitely one of those people that's mentored me throughout my journey at York and then there's myself as marketing and sponsorship manager and then Matty as marketing sponsor and exec so we're a relatively small team really for the race course the size of the race course. And you mentioned that you think your management style has, has evolved since having Charlie what sort of how would you describe the kind of styles that you employ and and how has that changed over time do you think Amy and do you think you've made a conscious effort to change your management style or has that just kind of naturally grown do you think? Um, I think it's naturally grown with the people that I've managed. So they've all been very different people. And um, we the nature of that role is it's not necessarily a role you are going to stay in for 10 years. So there's been quite a few people that have worked with me. And I've really, I've really enjoyed getting to know what makes people tick. So one thing that you can like is to making sure that they've got the right tasks for them. I don't think necessarily that my management style has, has changed so much when I've since I've had Charlie. Um, I think it's more my approach to how I do my role that's changed since I've had Charlie, really. Mm-hmm. We've had a question come in, Amy, as well, which is, how did you approach York about the balance between motherhood and career? This is something we've also been discussing a lot with the Racing Home Project. Have you got any comments on that? Um, I think it's testament to both William and James that, I didn't really have to think about how I approached it. Basically, so nice they, to hear. <laughs> they were like, what do you need? What, what can we do for you? How can we make it work? I'm passionate about making my job work. I've been there for a number of years and it was almost that they trusted me to know what I needed. So I basically said, I think I need to work three days a week and I would prefer them to be three consecutive days because what one thing I really was quite conscious of that I didn't want to just end up answering emails because they'd been I'd been not there one day and then I was there the next and not there the next day and I thought it to really drive any projects forward or drive my work forward I needed to be there for a chunk of days um to be honest yeah I kind of just said what I thought I needed for my role and they they trusted that that was my role and had been for a number of years and I, I knew what I needed to do in its best interest to myself and the business. So it was quite easy, that, really. That's wonderful. That is really wonderful. And and um, tell me about a little bit about how your days pan out on a day-to-day basis. So if somebody's interested in a career in marketing and sponsorship, on a sort of average day, what would you be up to? And and what about a race day as well? Because I'm sure everyone would love, I sort of see, of course, as I work out, I see the marketing um, execs running around looking very busy <laughs> how yeah. do you how does your kind of race day differ from your day-to-day and what are your responsibilities and, and jobs on those in those two different settings Amy um so they're completely different um I would say day-to-day I am very much because I work three days a week and because of what I do so I like the consistency for our team now is Matty rather than myself so any sponsors that we have James there's, I've got a few relationship responses, but genuinely, James will have the relationships with the top level management and the sponsorship, and then Matty will help him deliver that. So that used to be a lot of my role was delivering the sponsorship. So whether that was branding or race card adverts or where they're the right logo for them, what presenter they were going to have on a race day, what trophies they wanted, that was used to be my role, and that's more Matty's role now. So day to day, mine is more about kind of managing those relationships we've got with people. There's a few things that um, are really close to my heart at York. So Macmillan Charity Race Day is a day that I head up. And so a lot of my time goes on projects like Macmillan Charity Race Day, for instance. 
no two days are ever the same. I'm always quite conscious now since having Charlie that I, you can't spend your day answering emails. So I'll do that right in the beginning of the day, answer my emails. And then something I learned from the management academy is I'll always write down six things I want to do during the day. So that'll be a mixture of tasks, whether that's um, a big thing that I've been avoiding for three weeks and actually need to do, or there'll be something that's a really quick and easy win that I'll put on there. So I'll do a mixture of tasks. I'll prioritize them and try and get through those during the day as well. Um, so that's kind of day to day. Um, from a race day perspective, it's it's manic. And genuinely, at the end of the day, you know you've been rushing around all day and people will say, well, what's your day been like? And you look at them in a daze because you're like, well, we've delivered a race day. I'm not quite sure how we've got here, but we're at the end, um, which is it's a fantastic feeling. But for instance, there's some, a few stories I can tell in terms of we have... Um, our for the Skybet Ebor, we have the draw for the horses two days before on the Thursday of Welcome to Yorkshire Ebor Festival, which is also Ladies' Day. And I've also got a couple of key sponsors on that day. Basically, there's not enough time on that Thursday morning to do everything you need to do. Going into it, I genuinely know this. I'm like, there's just not enough time. I need to delegate to people and I need to get organised. But if something goes wrong, then you you just have to fix it. So something had gone wrong, and um, I and I always say in events that things do go wrong, and it's about how you manage what that what goes wrong that is the outcome, whether it's success or failure. Not that something went wrong in the first place, because that's always going to happen in events. But something had obviously gone wrong, and I can remember William ringing me whilst I was trying to get changed and put my makeup on to go into the e board draw. And I had got one eye with mascara on and one eye without. And it took till the third race for me to have mascara on both eyes. So that's genuinely like what a race day can be like at York. And to be honest, all race days, all race courses, I'm sure. And it's just getting ready for a massive event. And it's fantastic, but I love that. And I know some people that don't love that. Like it, it can be a really pressured environment on a race day, but that's when I come alive. It's just amazing just to see people there having an amazing time and just... To be like I've been part of delivering this event is just a fantastic feeling. Mm, definitely, definitely. The buzz of a of a big race day in particular, I think when you're working in that environment, it is busy. And by the end of the day, your feet hurt and you've done God knows how many steps. But you kind of you do get that thrill, I think, don't you? That's it's hard to replicate in in others in other environments but yeah it sounds sounds phenomenal you really get the taste for it when you're through your descriptions Amy it's lovely to hear those <laughs> those stories um and you've mentioned James and William as people who've been important in your career um had you have they sort of naturally mentored you Amy have you ever sought out I guess a more official mentor obviously we you know we offer our mentoring scheme through women in racing and you know we really encourage people to to have mentors for their careers what's been your experience of mentoring either formally or, or informally and how has that really impacted on your career so far do you think yeah I did look at it more formally um a number of years ago but then I think what that did was made me understand what a mentor was and made me understand that I actually already had them and that it was up to me to use them a little more so now I will I can remember having, we have discussions like sometimes we go to new, well, we haven't recently, but there'll be often times we go to Newmarket a couple of times a year. And that's a three hour trip from York. And it's a fantastic opportunity just to be in the car with William or James and be like, this is where I think I'm at. Where do we think I'm going? Or just those conversations in terms of a bigger insight in what, what's happening at York. And They've always, both of them have been incredibly open with me and they're always open to ideas. Their doors are always open. I genuinely say that, like, James has been fantastic, that I can go into James's office. Well, we used to go into James's office. We're now in the press room at the moment as the marketing team. But I, and he's never said to me, can you just wait five minutes? He's never said, I'm too busy to speak to you about anything. And now looking back, when I was, when I first started working at York, there would be some pretty menial things I'd go to him for, like, and, and I know, now know more what his job involves. And he must have been mega stressed about, well, James doesn't get stressed. He's very, he's very level-headed and fantastic at his job. 
but there must have been some really high level stuff he was dealing with and then I was coming in being like oh I think I need an extra 20 number cloths do you think that'll be okay or I've got number one missing of a number cloth I'm just gonna order another one and he would never say can we just speak about this in five minutes or tomorrow and I know I'm guilty of that I do that myself and he's been fantastic and he has listened to me about anything and everything and they both have and I think and as well sometimes I feel for them because they and I'm not I, I don't mind in discussing like the difference between men and women in roles and, and particularly myself I know that I'm a kind of extreme person I'm either like really chilled out about a race day or really stressed or kind of feel like I'm really organized or I'm not there's never a middle ground with me so I can go mm. into like I'm, I'm a lot older now but I still am quite emotional I can go into James and be crying and I can see him being like I'm not sure this is genuinely like but now he knows me he's worked with me for 10 12 years and that's fine and they've just been really respectful of who I am and just nurtured me and I think it's just been yeah it, they're, they're fantastic both of them Mm. but I think sometimes some people and you know I, I hasten to you know hate to say it, but some men would view that degree of emotion as super negative in the workplace whereas actually James has clearly managed to harness your passion which is the flip side of that Amy and and actually has, has then nurtured you to bring you on as not just a phenomenal employee but a loyal employee as well and actually just wreck it is a bit like what you were saying before about understanding how to work with the people that you've got he has obviously recognized that you're someone that occasionally will need an arm around you rather than a chastisement for being being emotional quote unquote and and actually that brings the best out of you under other circumstances yeah and I also think I'm quite passionate about never apologizing I never apologize for crying that's who I am or I'd never apologize for I'm quite a fiery person and I never apologize for what, what I do, I'm well, not, not fiery in terms of to people, but in terms of like my, I'll get annoyed when something hasn't gone right or, and, but that's who I am. And I think that also has helped that I'll, I'll never go and say, I'm really sorry for like getting upset earlier because that's, that's, that's my style and that's what I do. Mm. Mm. And I'm sure they love you for it all the more. <laughs> and um, so, so tell us what's coming up. You're obviously racing with crowds on, on Saturday. Um, what have you got coming up? Are you returning to non-racing events this year as well, Amy? What's kind of in the pipeline for, for you and for York, I guess, coming up? Yeah, so like I've alluded to before, um, we've got kind of a bit more of a confidence now that I don't think we've been able to have um, for the last year. So the Welcome to Yorkshire Ebor Festival um, falls at the end of August. So it's the, it starts the 18th of August. And so I know at the moment there's, there's some uncertainty around the 21st of June, but it's the back end of August. So we feel that people are ready for to come together and have a party, whatever it may look like. And um, we're really, really looking forward to, to that festival. Um, Macmillan Charity Race Day is, um, it falls, um, is still in within the 4,000 crowd capacity. So that has been something that I've been looking at um, recently in terms of what that'll look like and mm. um, how we will still support Macmillan. So for instance, the um, Ride of Their Lives has been moved to our new 25th of September date, just to give the riders for that charity race more time to um, prepare both more time to do, they raise a phenomenal amount each year and um, more time to ride out, more time to do their charity events. And it just gives the, like for instance as well, we wouldn't have known how many people they'd be able to invite. So we, normally this, that each rider has about 50 or 60 people that come and support them. So we've chosen to move that. So that's something I've been working quite hard is because as well, because we didn't have the race day last year, it would have been the 50th Macmillan charity race day this year. Yeah. So it's how, which is a shame, but also mm. what I've been talking to Macmillan around is it doesn't stop next year being 51. We've still got a really, like a, 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 such a long relationship with them. Mm. And that doesn't go away just because we haven't been able to celebrate the 50th. So we'll celebrate it being a long relationship next year, but that's something we've been working on. But yeah, and in terms of non-race day events, we're getting the interest back now in terms of 
weddings and conferences and, and what those can look like for people, which is fantastic for York Racecourse Hospitality. Their, their season, we kind of put, we can put the season to bed in October and then start thinking about what May might look like for us. But in terms for them, like they lost Christmas, which is our like second biggest turnover after racing. And you can't underestimate like the impact they would have had big events, we had big conferences at York. There's something always going on at York and the impact of not having those through the pandemic and there everything's starting to come a bit more alive now at York. It, it's fantastic. It's really nice to see. Yeah, well, having attended various conferences at, at York, I can vouch for how good it is. And I have to say the stable staff across the board will tell you that the food is the best at York. So <laughs> um, they certainly know how to look after you. Um, and, and I know people are very grateful to be to be coming back and to be looking forward to the season ahead. Um, Amy, thank you so much. I feel like this has been a, a real um, come and work at York advert. <laughs> Absolutely. We have no vacancies, I'm afraid. So. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> well, maybe in time. And um, certainly I know, um, hopefully, if anybody is watching this back, if you have any questions, you'd like to reach out to Amy, don't hesitate to contact us. I know she'll be ready to ask any questions, even if she's a little snowed under with work experience people. Um, I'm sure she'll be willing to help in any way she can um so do um send us an email or get in touch with amy at york um she's a really really lovely person and has been a long part of uh, women in racing we're very grateful to have her as part of the organization and the membership so um thank you everybody for attending thank you everyone in the audience thank you amy and we will see you next time don't forget women in racing agm coming up we will send you more details and that is with claire balding so yes thank you everybody thank you amy and good Thanks, night amy. Bye -bye. Yes.